you will hear the story of John Martin's desperate voyage across the Bering Sea to Siberia in an eight-foot Walker Bay dinghy. <laughs> Subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing, where you'll hear the stories of the most interesting sailors in the world, like the two Hawaii sailors who were rescued after five months at sea. Alaskan John Martin, after his passport was revoked, he was desperate to be reunited with his wife and son in China. So he set sail on an eight-foot Walker Bay rowing dinghy down the Yukon River and into the Bering Sea. The Bering Sea is home to some of the most notorious weather and biggest waves in the world. But wild currents pushed him towards the Arctic Ocean and he had to abandon his desperate voyage for his family in Siberia. Hear the whole story from John Martin right now. I read about your story, and I was just really intrigued. I, we have a Walker Bay on our boat with the sailing kit, and uh, I was just so impressed by your uh, sailing trip, and I just wanted to hear the story. Okay. Well, I can tell you, first of all, that Walker Bay is quite a boat, and I, I picked it for the journey because of the um, stability ring, the inflatable ring, and the fact that it had a pretty nice sailing package. And, um, yeah, I, I was really impressed. It, it did quite well. Uh, the Yukon River had its own challenges when it came to weather. You know, it did fine on the river, and it did fine in the sea. So where were you when you started the journey in the Walker Bay? When I put in into the Tanana River, which um, was basically my entry point according to the road system. So I had a friend uh, drive me up to Nanana, where the Tanana uh, meets the road. And, and I took the Tanana to the Yukon, and I took the Yukon to the sea. And so it took me four weeks to, to reach the Bering Sea and then two weeks to cross. Are there a lot of rapids in the Yukon and the Tanana? I wouldn't say rapid. Um, it's all depending on the weather. So if the weather's calm, then I would say there's nothing like a rapid. Um, but it's such a big river that when the wind kicks up, it can get quite rough. I believe it. So why did you uh, want to start so far inland on the Walker Bay? Was that just the, your best means of transportation? Well, in Alaska, there are no roads that reach the sea. So the road system is it's really doesn't reach the interior or the western coast of Alaska, so I, I took the river to reach the sea. How big was your Walker Bay? It was the eight footer, which is the smaller one that they make, and I purposely chose the smallest one for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is um, to you know try to be undetected, since I was trying to reach China without documents, and the other was to be light enough that I could handle it myself in case I needed to pull it up the beach or something, uh, especially on the, the area of the river reaching the sea. So did you have any problems before you got to uh, the uh, Bering Straits and the ocean? Minor problems. I had a couple of times I was pinned down onto the uh, riverbank where I couldn't uh, get off the shore due to the wind being too strong. And it was uh, challenging a few times to just to get back into the water since the wind was, was pretty fierce. And then I did break my rudder, which was really as a result of my own um, inexperience. I had raised my keel a couple of times when I got into shallow enough water where my keel was touching, which then that meant that my rudder was sticking out lower than the keel. So I ended up um, hitting ground a couple of times, and I'm sure that's why I broke my rudder, broke, broke the, the rudder hinge. Pen. It sounds like it was very cold too, right? What what time of year were you sailing in well, the, I got to the river? On August 1st. And I was far enough north that there was still snow standing where the drifts had not melted out yet. And it was quite cold, you can say, especially as I was heading, getting pushed north on the Bering Sea. So you didn't, you know, I mean, when you even when you beach the boat on the river, it's pretty cold to, you know, dip your toes in the water. I mean, it's all relative. I certainly um, had my toes in the water plenty of times. I, I wore only sandals because I figured if I was wearing boots, the water would easily come over the top. So I just wore sandals. So I was feet in the river um, every time I hit shore. Okay. You'd lived in Alaska for how long? Lived here most of my life. You wanted to 
across the Bering Sea from Alaska to Asia to go to China. Is you you have a wife and and some kids there? Is that right? My wife and my son. My um, wife and son are in China, and I've not seen them since 2007, other than a like video chat and internet. And you don't have a passport. You've had trouble getting a passport. Is that part of the reason why you wanted to take the Walker bag? Yeah, fact was is I. I uh, lost my passport while I was in China due to being behind on child support for my first marriage. So once I took the child support, then it put me in a situation where in order to get my passport back, I would have had to get caught up on the child support. But by then I was in a pretty big hole. And when they took my passport, it just put me in a bad spot with um, all the business that I had, everything that I had achieved to that point uh, was lost. So it just left me with the hole to recover from. And you can say I've never recovered from that. So how old is your son? He's 12 now. Okay. What city did you set off from in the Walker Bay to uh, Russia and China? Yeah, where we launched the, the boat was Nanana. So my friend drove me from Anchorage, which is like a six-hour drive probably. And so when, when I left by boat, it was in the Tanana River from Nanana. Okay. And... What uh, was it like sailing in the Pacific Ocean in a, a Walker Bay 8? Well, I tell you, I had no sailing experience when I bought the boat, so I tried to prepare myself by going out on some lakes and some rivers here in Alaska. But certainly, just getting onto the Tanana River, I was really learning how to sail for four weeks while I got to the Bering Sea. So, fortunately, you know, the wind was consistent, and for the first 11 days, I was really just nothing too complicated when it came to sailing. It was easy sailing, you could say. Once the wind died, there was just nothing I could do but go with the current. And that's what took me so far north that I ended up taking land in Russia. Did you have very much water with you or food with you? Well, <laughs> plenty of food. Water became an issue. I had a mishap leaving Demonic where I ended up losing most of my provisions. Uh, as it was, I had tethered everything in a in a duffel bag to the side of my boat because of the boat being so small, I, I floated it outside the boat, tethered it. But when I left Emonic, I needed to make a trip back to up to Emonic to make some adjustments. I built a shelter that just wasn't working out, and I flagged down a boat to have them tow me back. And when I tossed them the, the line, they started pulling before I was ready, and I just snapped the tether line, and I lost most of my supplies. So I, at that time, made a quick dash to the store and got a couple of gallons of grape juice, in part for the, you know, to replace the water that was lost. And, and I thought by getting the juice, it would contribute in the way of sugar and vitamin and whatever came with it. And so I was really leaving low. And at that point, I thought that I was going to get more water along the way, but it just didn't work out. So you were hoping to catch water, but you didn't really end up catching very much? Yeah, my first thought was that I was going to just fill up from the river, but then it occurred to me as I was leaving that the area of the river I was in was downriver from the processing plant in Emonic, and I thought, you know, all the waste that they're grinding up and pumping back into the river could make some kind of imbalance with bacteria or something, and so I didn't want to take on that water. However, I'd been drinking the water from the Yukon and the Tanana the whole way, but at that point, I was concerned about whether the water was really safe to drink. So then I thought I would stop on um, St. Lawrence Island as I went by, but it was so foggy that I passed it without seeing it, and it wasn't until I was actually past the island that I thought. So then my third thought for water was to collect from the rain, but when it did start to rain lightly, I had tried to collect water, but um, the tarp, the plastic that I brought was vinyl, and it just was too toxic to, to really um, consider that the water would be worth drinking. Okay, so when you were sent out to sea, you really only had the grape juice? The grape juice, about a gallon of water by that point, because I had lost pretty much everything else. And you were at sea for how many days before you hit land when you left Alaska? 14 days, two weeks, until I actually hit Russian land. And you were becalmed for part of that time? Oh, okay, the first 11 days, there was really good wind. It wasn't too rough, it was just a nice, solid wind, so that I was able to keep maintaining headway, but after 11 days, it just flat calmed down to nothing, which I had expected from what little bit of understanding I had from the weather patterns, but what I wasn't prepared for is 
how fast the, the current could take me in three days. So it took me in three days from below St. Lawrence Island all the way up to basically to the Bering Strait, which was significantly farther than what I had gained in the 11 days of travel with wind. Okay, so it was pushing you north? Pushing me north, further north than what I started. So it, in um, three days, it pushed me north like twice as far as from where I had started. So the current kind of runs north through that Bering Strait. And on that side, on the west side, it does. I think on the east side, it, it's um, coming more southern. But um, by the time I got to the more western side of the, Bar of the Bering Sea, it was definitely pushing north. So when you hit Siberia, you were you were pretty far north. You were like in the like the western tip of Siberia. Is that right? Well, I don't know what they consider Siberia, um, but Russia, like the mainland of Russia, where I actually touched land, was essentially in the Bering Strait. By, by the time I had reached land, I was staring down the Diomede Island, so I knew I was pretty far north by the time I touched land, but I was still in the Bering Sea. I, I hadn't gotten pushed through into the Arctic Ocean. You needed water at that point. You were pretty thirsty. At that point, I was down to a couple cups of water. About a day or two, I had just kind of was taking a little more cautious approach to water, but I hadn't really started really like saving water yet. So, did, were you able to meet some people there in uh, Siberia? Okay, so the place where I where I touched land, I um, as it turned out, I got soaked in the surf. It was really rough water coming to shore. I thought, you know, if I can get on the shore and then once the weather calms down, then I would be on my way. In the surf, I got caught in the surf, got really wet. And there was no way I was getting off that beach until the weather cleared. So I started looking for shelter, and I found a little village there. And there was a family who was living there, or at least on their summer camp or, or whatever the situation was. I smelled uh, smoked salmon, so I knew somebody was there, and I just um, made it uh, interactive with them, got their attention, and they, um, they invited me in, fed me, um, put my stuff to the fire to dry, uh, let me sleep in their bed. They just really took care of me. And at the same time, they notified the officials that there was, you know, like some kind of a situation. They, they didn't speak English and I didn't speak Russian. So um, that was when the border security became involved. So for your sea voyage of 14 days, did you have any really big seas and bad weather? Were you ever in danger of being capsized or was it a pretty mild? I never in any real danger, but on the last day, when I was really close to shore, where the wind was funneling around the point of land that I came to, it got extremely rough, too rough for the boat, and the wind would be pushing so hard on the sail that the boat just didn't seem to be able to handle it, and then the wind would just shift so fast that the, that the sail would just whip across to the other side, and it just seemed like it would just tear the boat apart. I, it did end up breaking something in the way of like a, some kind of a catch on the, on the lower boom, um, but it held up until I got to shore, and if I would have had to, I would have had to make repair before I left again, but, you know, that was the roughest time, really the only severely rough weather. I mean, there was plenty of rough weather along the way that was had its own challenges, but that was the really the moment of extreme weather that I experienced. So maybe you had worse weather in the Yukon River than in the Bering Sea? Worst weather, that was the worst weather right there. Okay. That was the worst weather I experienced was on that point as I was coming into Russia on the day that I made landing. Extreme wind and weather. What day was that? It would have been the August 1st. Okay, so still the pretty much summer. That same morning. And then the Russians detained you because you didn't have a passport? Well, you know, first of all, I didn't have a passport. Um, obviously didn't have any visa or anything. Didn't enter through a point, port of entry. And so at that point, they just detained me. The border security detained me. And they like looked into the matter. And so right off the bat, they within just, I think, three days, they determined that it wasn't a criminal situation because I entered under like, emergency situation. So their their law had it, it accounted for certain situations. And so they declined to press anything like criminal charges. But they did fine me for something like, I forget, it was about 30 U.S. dollars. It was a pretty small fine. And then um, they were trying to figure out how to send me out of the country, but I didn't have any uh, documents to travel, so they couldn't put me on an airplane. So they tried charging me with being in the country illegally, but the court said I wasn't guilty because I was being held against my will. So they ended up charging me a second time, and the same result came back. And then after that, there's, somehow they got into the higher courts and did some appeal and came back around and ended up charging me with being in the country without documentation, and it, which is pretty minor when you consider it's not criminal. The charge, it was just administrative offense punishable by deportation. At that point, they sent me to Moscow, put me in their deportation center for about six weeks, and then sent me back. 
and the boat is still in Russia? It is. Um, the last day when they were getting ready to move me out of the area to send me to Moscow, they delivered the boat back to me, and I had been prepared just to walk away from the boat anyway, so I really wasn't too worried about it, but I didn't know what to do with it. But as it turned out, somebody suggested donating it to the museum, and that's where the boat is now. It's in the museum in the Chukotka region, the city of another. You're back in Alaska now. Where in Alaska are you? Okay. Okay. And you're you're working on a book about your story? Yes, and I posted. I've been posting it uh, on my website, so you could read like the first eight chapters, um, which all of the first chapters are events leading up to. I still have several chapters before I get to crossing the Bering Sea. If you've read some of the news, you're probably aware that some of the things that I've been involved in in the recent years have been a bit controversial. So all that in my book as well. Do you have a another plan to, to see your wife and child? Well, if I can publish the book uh, and make some money in the process, then maybe I can get my passport back. So let me know in the comments section what you thought of John Martin's story. Subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing, where you see the stories of the most interesting sailors in the world. And hit the bell notification icon! You'll probably want to check out our other video about a man who sailed across the Pacific 100 days alone in an engineless, electronic-free sailboat. <laughs>